Hello, welcome everybody to this evening's sustainability speaker series talk. My name is Megan. I'm a librarian here at SPL. I go by she, her pro, uh, pronouns. Um, and before we get started, I would like to acknowledge for myself um, that we're on Treaty 6 territory. Uh, I want to acknowledge that I'm recording here in Saskatoon on land that is the homeland um, of many different peoples and the traditional homeland of the Métis. And every time I think of reconciliation, I also think of the motto for Saskatchewan from many people's strength and how that phrase has taken on so many new meanings over the years, and now it's taking on a whole new discussion behind it. So I like doing a land acknowledgement and thinking sincerely about what that means uh, each time. That being said, uh, I will be recording the presentation this evening. Uh, your Attendance, your names will not be recorded. So there will be sort of the understanding of anonymity. Um, if you have a question for our presenter, please put it in the chat. I won't be looking at any uh, question and answers um, or hands raised in the Q&A feature. If you know where that is on Zoom, we won't be using it, just the chat. You can put them in there and then at the end of the presentation, we will do a question and answer period. So we'll start to address those then. If you find you're having issues and trying to figure out if the technological issues are on your end, um, in the chat at the bottom, it says two, and you can either message the hosts and panelists or you can message um, everyone. So if you send a message to the hosts and panelists, just me and Anang and Jan will see it. If you post a question, you will be sending it to everyone. You should be actively choosing which one you want the to be seen when you're in the chat. All right. Anang, I'll pass it off to you now to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Megan. Hi, everyone. I'm Anang. I'm one of the coordinators for the Sustainability Speaker Series. I am currently in Edmonton, which is on Treaty 6 territory, which is the homeland of uh, many Indigenous peoples. Uh, welcome to today's um, Sustainability Speaker Series talk. And before I introduce today's speaker, I'll a few words about the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. So the Saskatchewan Environmental Society works towards environmental sustainability through public education, policy development, and community events addressing issues related to sustainable energy and climate uh, solutions, water protection, biodiversity conversation, and reduction of toxic substances in our environment. And if you would like to receive email notifications of future events at the Sustainability Speaker Series, you can send an email to info at environmentalsociety.ca. Uh, info is I-N-F-O at environmentalsociety.ca. And in your message, ask to be put on the list of people to be notified of events at the um, Sustainability Speaker Series. Uh, this evening, our speaker is Jan Shadik. Jan is a certified wildlife rehabilitator who grew up with a love of animals and uh, began her involvement in wildlife rehabilitation back in 98 as a volunteer at the Nature Center in Connecticut. She moved to Saskatoon in 2001 and has been actively involved in all aspects of wildlife rehabilitation. Uh, she began the BIRDS initiative 
So birds in real danger, Saskatoon, B-I-R-D-S, after coordinating a nature city presentation about uh, bird deaths and injuries caused by collisions with glass windows. And uh, she continues to spearhead this venture alongside uh, nature, alongside Saskatoon Nature Society, uh, Saskatchewan Light Pollution Abatement Committee, and Wild Birds Unlimited. Jan is also the executive director of Living Sky Wildlife Rehabilitation, an organization she founded in 2010 that cares for up to 2,100 birds per year, as well as mammals. Uh, Jan sits on the Western and Northern Canadian Council for Animal Care Committee for Environment and Climate Change Canada. In recognition of her work, Jen has received the Saskatchewan Network uh, Environmental Activist. Uh, I'll take that again. In recognition of her work, Jen has received the Saskatchewan Environmental Network SEN Environmental Activist Award, the Eco-Friendly Nature City Festival Award, as well as the Hero of the Month by 98 Cool FM. Uh, today, Jan will be speaking about the many perils facing birds, an overview of latest research and what we can do. The title of Jan's presentation is On a Collision Course, Birds and Humans. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jan. Hi, thank you very much. I will go ahead and share my screen and get that set up if we're good with that. Go for it, Jan. Okay. Just give you a few seconds. Hopefully that works. Did that work? Looks great. Perfect. Excellent. Fantastic. Good. Thank you very much um, to Megan Carroll and Anang for inviting me to do this talk tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about birds in almost any capacity, and Birds and Windows is one of my passion um, issues that I that I very much like to talk about and uh, and address and try to fix. Um, I will also begin by acknowledging um, that the land on which Living Sky Wildlife Rehabilitation operates is Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of Cree people and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, additionally, I also want to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is historically wild land that belonged to the wild non human animals since the beginning of time, and that our presence here is often at their expense. Um, I have been the executive director for Living Sky Wildlife Rehabilitation since it was founded in 2010. Um, I had been doing rehabilitation before that, and it, um, it became very clear that uh, we needed to create a, an organization to be able to do the work. Um, and be able to raise funds uh, as we started to take in an increasing number of animals. So in 2010, we had taken in 150, and last year we took in tw over 2,100, um, not counting the 687 bats. Um, so it was, uh, it was a busy, it's been busy and it's been continuing to grow. So tonight I want to talk about um, birds and humans and um, the intersection of these creatures. Let's see if we can make this work. And let's say go forward. Oh, please work. Okay. All right. Um, I really wanted to be able to. All right. Okay. Um, my, my guess is, is that if you are participating in this series of talks, um, you have some ideas of why birds are a valuable asset to the planet and to human survival. Birds occur somewhere in every single ecosystem on the planet, on land, at sea, from the Arctic to the Antarctic. They are food sources for other animals and they contribute to planetary health in so many, so many different ways. Our mental health um, studies continue to show that being in nature and watching nature, birds in particular, um, even from your window can increase your sense of well-being. It raises your mood and brings a sense of peace and joy. 
Cleanup crew, vultures, and other scavengers remove the carrion from the landscape incredibly efficiently, reducing disease transmission from carcasses that would otherwise be left to rot. Um, I've actually been traveling, and we went through um, several different areas, and there were no ravens, and um, and the vultures aren't here right now, and uh, the amount of dead animals on the roadside was quite horrifying, I, I'll be honest. Um, and it made me think of where are the scavengers? And, uh, and so they're, they're very useful that way. Pollination and seed distribution. They have long been, been known as sort of the Johnny Appleseed planters of the world. Their role in seed dispersal is universal. Um, our mallards actually keep wetlands connected and alive um, by taking um, seeds from one wetland and pooping them out in another one. Um, forest birds spread the spores from mushrooms, which maintains forest health. Um, and as pollinators, they may not be as crucial to North America. They create beauty by spreading our wildflowers. Um, and they are, there are about 2,000 species of pollinating birds worldwide that keep our rainforests alive. Pest management. There are a lot of vineyards and farmers that put up swallow and bluebird nesting boxes to attract aerial insectivores as pest managers, boxes for barn owls to come and eat the mice and other rodents. It's a free service and it reduces the use of pesticides significantly. If you can think of 60 insects per hour, that is a whopping 850 per day. Habitat creation, abandoned woodpecker holes create habitat for other smaller birds and increase survival and nesting success. Fertilization, guano is actually a highly sought after fertilizer um, until the synthetic fertilizers grew in popularity. Maybe if there was more of a reliance on the birds, we would recognize their value more and be slightly less cavalier in our treatment of them. The alarm systems, the canary in the coal mine is one way to use birds as an alarm system, but they are also notorious for signaling anyone in earshot that a predator is nearby, whether it's by commotion or by science. And so they won't, can warn both other birds as well as mammals of predators in the area. One of the best ways as a bird watcher to find owls during the day is to listen for crows and magpies mobbing an owl, a great horned owl that they have found in a tree. So if you hear that mobbing sound and you go over there, very often you find yourself an owl. Food guides. Ravens are also known to follow humans and non-human hunters, um, but humans also follow birds. Whether it's meat or honey, humans and non-humans have been known to watch the birds and use them as guides to a food source. Let's see. Hmm. I'm trying to figure out how to make this thing go forward without... Um, it doesn't want to go. All right. I'll just have to click it. Um, Okay, so some of the threats, we have habitat loss, um, which is absolutely worldwide. We have pesticide use, which is particularly an issue for aerial insectivores. Aerial insectivores have seen an 80% drop in population in the last 50 years. Free roaming cats, estimates of about 2 million free roaming cats um, on Hawaii alone are absolutely decimating the bird populations there. Hawaii's 142 endemic bird species have already disappeared, um, and about 2.4 billion birds annually in the U.S. Um, glass structures, windows, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. There's estimates of about 42 million birds a year in Canada and 988 million in the U.S. Power lines and cell structures. There are 200,000 231,966 kilometers of transmission lines. Boy, it's hard to say those numbers. Across Canada, um, they are mostly actually in the boreal and um, in the boreal forest. And mortality is again estimated in the millions of birds a year. Fences are a huge problem. Um, we tend to think of mammals as impacted by fences, but birds are often, we often get in birds that are stuck on barbed wires and that sort of thing particularly those that are above a water body. Motor vehicles, um, about 340 million birds suffer fatal injuries from vehicle encounters um, every year in the US. I'm not sure that we track that in, the, in Canada. Wind farms, as useful as they are for sustainability, about a quarter million to a half million birds a year die after hitting wind turbines. And I know that there's a lot of work that's going into that. Um, and there are definitely some improvements that are coming from that.
Um, hunting, annual waterfowl hunts, kills about 15 million birds a year in North America. At the end of this list, I always walk away and go, how do we have any birds left? Um, and, uh, but illegal hunting is a huge issue elsewhere in the world. Communication towers, um, there's, again, you have guide wires that are a huge problem as well as just collisions with that. Climate change is rather unmeasurable and yet it's a huge issue. Um, and then there's all sorts of other threats to our birds. And so the, the idea is, uh, I believe it's of four robin eggs in a nest, um, three will hatch, two will actually make it to migration, and if we're lucky, one will make it back from migration. So um, birds face a lot of threats uh, on a regular basis from birth all the way through. The top threats are going to be habitat loss, which is um, an overwhelming issue that um, I know that the sustainability folks are definitely working on. And um, as an individual, it feels hard to try and address that, except in little tiny ways. Cats, I always try and say, please keep your cats indoors. And the one we're going to talk about tonight, which is glass and windows. And number four is pesticides. So very often with, particularly with habitat loss, we get overwhelmed by eco-anxiety um, and worries about the future of the earth and the life that it shelters, um, climate change distress. Um, so we take small steps and some of those small steps are for birds. When you look at these four top threats, you can do something on about at least three of them very quickly uh, and easily. And that's one of the things I'd like to highlight tonight is that fixing the problem of birds and windows um, is, is incredibly easy. So unless you're Christy Morrissey, um, addressing pesticides can also be a little bit difficult, uh, except for not using it in your own yard. Um, so I'm going to use windows and glass interchangeably. Um, windows are obviously made of, generally made of glass, but we seem to be using glass in an increasing number of places and ways. They, glass covers um, buildings. We are now using glass for our porches and our railings. And, um, and that is actually a huge issue. Um, birds not only bump into the glass railings from the outside, I've also had them get stuck on the inside and not be able to figure out how to get out because they haven't figured out how to go up and over. Um, and so they just sort of bounce back and forth between one piece of glass and another. It's really, um, it's really an, an unfortunate way of doing that. Um, whoops, now what did I just do? Okay, there we go. Uh, I'm going to turn off the chat. So those are some of the top threats. The greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. It's one of my favorite quotes. Um, Canada is widely considered to be a progressive, civilized country with plenty of laws on the books to protect its citizens from various forms of violence, disorderly conduct, and theft. We have a dismal record when it comes to protecting animals from cruelty, abuse, and neglect. Um, World Animal Protection gives grades to each country. Um, Canada is actually a D, along with the United States, Peru, and Australia, believe it or not. Um, it's one of the lowest marks for, having, um, for not having adequate legislation to protect wildlife in captivity, working animals, animals used in research, and pets. Um, so I, Canada has a, has a ways to go, and this is one of the ways that we can do something to help our birds and our wildlife. When is the, the sort of most important time in terms of birds and windows? Um, if you look at the map, I don't know if you can tell, but Saskatoon is at an intersection um, where we, are, we have three migratory pathways coming through our city. And so we're not only on the central flyway, the sort of green one, um, but also the Mississippi flyway and the, some of the Atlantic flyway birds also come, through, come our way heading up to the Arctic, um, which makes it be wonderful and a fantastic place to be if you are a birder. Um, because there's just an amazing rich diversity during migration season, which is coming up pretty quick. And you'll see all of us getting warbler neck looking up into the trees and trying to spot the birds. Um, but it also makes it that much more important to take steps to keep these birds safe along the way. 
In the spring, it's going to be the birds that have been successful at going down, overwintering wherever they were. So they survived all the way down. They survived all winter with all of the threats down there, whatever they might be. And now they're coming back and they're almost back to their breeding sites and they're exhausted and they're hungry and they're tired and they have this huge urge to get back to where they need to be. Um, and it's, it's just, for me, it's quite sad when they hit a window and become injured and either just lose the breeding season or it's a fatal um, window strike and they don't they they've put in so much effort to get this far and and uh, and then they're toasted in the fall it's a bit of a different story we have all of the young birds that are leaving the boreal forest they have no idea what glass cats dogs fences cars are and uh, and so the 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 bump if you will in the number of birds that are hitting glass goes way up. Um, it's uh, it's pretty flat in the winter, and then there's a bump in the spring when the birds come back, and then all the local birds kind of figure out where the windows are, and so it goes down a little bit, and then we have a huge bump up again in terms of our um, numbers in the fall until the snow flies, and hopefully everybody is where they need to be, and uh, and then the numbers go down a little bit. So timing wise, um, there's spring and fall migration. Um, but we have about a billion birds migrating through Saskatchewan each year and about 42 million colliding with windows across Canada. The difference of night and day, lots of people think of window strikes as a nighttime um, issue, night po light pollution at night. Um, and what I say is that there's an intersection between light pollution and window strikes. Um, night is the time for migration for, for many birds. It's cooler um, and they can get um, further. There are no predators. There's, there's a reason that they migrate at night and it has worked for them until um, we have built our cities and created these incredibly lit areas that are very unnatural. So they developed this ability to navigate in the dark millennia ago. And their instincts, unfortunately, cannot account for the bright lights of cities. And so it confuses them just as when you have um, headlights in your eyes and you really can't see and you kind of just have to stop moving because you can't figure out where you're going. And so when they get confused like that, they fly in a circle. And so they fly in a circle over a city that has sort of caught them in, in the headlights, so to speak. And, um, and then they, they become exhausted. And so they come down to ground, they wake up in the morning and they are in a, they're, they're not where they meant to be. And they're disoriented and confused. And there's all this glass around them. And it's a bit like being in one of those carnival houses. If you were ever lucky enough to go in one of those where all those mirrors were around you and you couldn't figure out which way to go to actually get out of that room or that space. And that's where the birds kind of find themselves in in the morning um, after being quite um, disoriented at night. And so that's when they're, these birds are, are smashing into windows because they're trying desperately to, to figure out how to get out of this um, very confusing space. So nighttime migration brings birds. And whenever you have that sort of increase in the number of birds in an area, you're automatically going to have an increase in the number of window strikes. Um, outside of migration, um, most birds flying around more frequently during the daytime hours, and so then it increases the chances of collision with a building, um, and uh, except for your local birds that hopefully figure out where to go. So night is, is very much an issue for birds, and we need to turn out the lights, and I know that uh, International Migratory Bird Day, which is coming up on May 14th. Um, it, it is about to turn out the lights. Uh, that is the, the very much the goal of that particular day. And the Saskatoon Nature Society, as well as Living Sky Wildlife Rehabilitation, are going to be doing some walks and some talks about um, birds and migrations and windows and lights um, and focusing on um, hopefully convincing Saskatoon to become um, a certified bird friendly city. I see Regina has. So I'm going to throw the challenge out there to Saskatoon. Um, if Regina can do it, Saskatoon can do it. And uh, the Saskatoon Nature Society is spearheading that. So if you're interested, contact them to give them a hand. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of the difference, because I think sometimes when people think of um, birds and migration and 
windows, they think of nighttime and light pollution. And uh, there's definitely intersection. Features of concern, when you're looking at a particular building, what makes that building dangerous? And the first thing that's gonna make that building dangerous is the amount of glass on the building. Um, as well as sort of how high is the building? Is it one story or is it 40 stories? The amount um, and height of nearby greenery. And again, if you can think about that, um, the birds are going to be living in the bushes or in the trees. And so the height of the bushes or the height of the trees is going to give more or less danger to that particular building. Location, 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 location. Um, Location is a big one. If you're really close, if you're on a migratory pathway, which is all of the city of Saskatoon, um, if you are nearby to a park or to an area where birds tend to congregate, such as the river in Saskatoon. Um, so again, you have river landing. There are tall buildings. They're completely made out of glass and there's a bunch of greenery and they're right on the river. Um, it's, a, it's a huge um, dangerous location for birds. Tunnel effects. The tunnel effect is when the birds can see through the building. And so they are, they're just, they're still flying. Like they don't realize that there is a solid object in front of them. And so they just sort of keep going. And then of course, reflectivity. What is the ability of the glass to reflect the greenery and the trees around them? Um, and with this one, I do tend to think of innovation place, which is full of glass and, um, and it is all incredibly reflective. Um, so those are some of the issues and we'll look at those a little closer. Um, the amount of glass on a building is directly correlated with the number of bird fatalities. Um, and again, glass windows, um, it includes balconies, railings, and other invisible structures um, in the human landscape. Um, at one point when Saskatoon built walkways over some of the new, high, uh, the new roads, they put uh, glass panels on each side. Um, and I'm really happy to say that they have subsequently uh, retrofitted those with some uh, feather friendly dots. And, and so those, those are hopefully now a little bit more visible to the birds, but otherwise they would just they would be flying over and uh, and smash into this very solid um, solid substance uh, that they hadn't actually seen. Um, so height um, height is very much related to the amount of greenery near the building. So these buildings, while the height may or may not be a huge issue for some of our local birds, the height is going to be an issue at night because those lights are taken that, that much higher into the sky. And so these kind of skyscrapers are, are going to be contributing to the light pollution at night. And these skyscrapers are going to be the issue um, for the migrating birds and bringing that light up and, and confusing them and getting them to, to end up inside the city rather than being able to continue their migration and go on outside of the city. Um, and so it's a, this, is, this is one of the intersections of light pollution and birds and windows um, collisions because they, they very much, they attract the migratory birds to the light. These are some examples of um, reflectivity. Um, these are more of a risk to the daytime birds if they have been migrating and are not familiar with the surroundings. You can see in these that there's lots of greenery next to them, but they also have glass, um, glass railings on the one on the left. The bottom one, it's the reflectivity that is again reflecting the amount of greenery that is nearby. And so if I was a bird, um, I wouldn't recognize that all those little squares are actually telling me that it's glass. I would think that that was a tree and I would try and fly into it. Um, and the artist's rendering in the top right suggests that they're going to put lots of trees around this building, but there's unfortunately a lot of very reflective glass. And so again, you have the number, the amount of greenery, the height of the building, the amount of glass on the building. Location, location, location. These are beautiful. I would love to live in one of these buildings, but they are all um, just 
bird death traps. Um, I can't imagine being in a glass building in the forest. I think I would probably just rather be in my sleeping bag. But if buildings near waterways, green belts, parks, naturalized areas, they're all going to be more at risk to birds um, than buildings in the middle of a concrete desert. Um, there's just going to be a lot more birds in these habitats. Um, and so these, these are beautiful places to live. Um, we just need to do something about making sure that that glass is visible to the birds. Uh, Rime Modern um, is a really good example of uh, the tunnel effect where you can just kind of look through the building and think that you're still going somewhere. So these are some examples of tunnels, um, certainly the walkways um, on campus. And, and some of those, thank you very much, have been retrofitted with dots, which makes me really, really happy and very excited. Um, but otherwise, there's absolutely no reason for the bird to slow down. There's no reflection issues. There's just the idea that there's no barrier. And so they unfortunately tend to collide at, at full speed. So again, it's really beautiful for us humans because we're bringing that outside in but for birds we have to figure out how to show them that it is um, that it's a solid surface and they probably shouldn't fly through it the rink shack was a really good example of that right on the riverbank beautiful downtown saskatoon um, windows on both sides and so i was really 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 happy last summer um, miwasin got a whole bunch of dots and uh, and myself and and i helped out with their volunteers getting dots up on the up on the, the windows on both sides and i'm so i'm quite hopeful that we have um, stopped a whole bunch of birds from from smashing into these these windows so we'll see. I would be curious if anybody had done sort of a pre-test before last summer and then tested after we got those dots back up. Um, but I was very happy that Miwasun was able to do that. Um, reflectivity, again, I tend to think of innovation place, beautiful glass buildings, chock full of mirrored facades, lush green landscaping, very dangerous place for the birds. Um, you will probably never find a dead bird there because if you ever go there, there's so many magpies. And so the magpies just kind of swoop in and clean them right up. Um, so in the case of reflection here, the birds are just headed for the greenery that they see. And, uh, and unfortunately, um, they oftentimes hit the windows. Factors include migration season that we've talked about, the pathway, which we are right smack dab on the middle of, species characteristics. I used to say that we very rarely ever saw pigeons that hit windows. I used to say, oh, pigeons don't hit windows. And yet we have gotten in so many pigeons that have been window strike birds in the last few years. I will tell you, though, that I think that that is probably due to the fact that Saskatoon um, uh, allows the use of, of Avatrol, which is a neurotoxin poison. And so my suspicion is uh, that these are pigeons that have eaten some of the neurotoxin, become very addled and confused, um, and not really kind of knowing what they're doing, smash into windows. Um, and, uh, and then, and that's kind of, I, I think what's happening because pigeons are usually pretty good about not smashing into windows. Um, and city characteristics, again, are we a tall city? Are we a short city? Um, we're, we, Saskatoon so far is not super tall like Toronto. And so where the fatal light attraction program um, flap finds um, tons of birds that are downed from all of the night light, um, the light pollution. And so they go out at four or five in the morning and find all these birds in downtown where there's no trees, but it's all these birds that have kind of had to come down because they got exhausted from being caught in the light. We're very different. And so when Michael Mazur came out um, and spent some time in Saskatoon, his comment was that we would have a different issue than Toronto. Um, and it would be more likely that we would have daytime strikes um, as opposed to sort of nighttime fallout um, terminology. And so, uh, so we're a little bit different. I would also say that in terms of species, we don't see a lot of geese colliding with windows, um, but that's also because they don't really migrate through the city and they tend to migrate during the day. Um, and so they don't land within the cities. Um, I used to say we don't usually see a lot of raptors um, in terms of like owls and that kind of thing, but the raptors have actually learned how to use windows to their advantage. Um, and they have figured out that if they chase birds so that the birds hit the window, 
shows, then the bird either falls to the ground and is either dead or stunned and they can sort of swoop in and, and have a meal. Um, whether this is um, deliberate use of windows, uh, which would require some learning involved, or if it's sort of an accidental byproduct of, of them chasing the birds, I'm not sure. Um, nobody has really kind of proven why or how they are doing this. Um, unfortunately, I, I sort of wonder if it's a byproduct because we get in a lot of Merlins um, and Cooper's Hawks and Occipiters, um, Sharpshins that, uh, that have also hit the windows. And so they're flying after their food and, and whether that the food kind of deeks out of the way and they can't deek fast enough or, um, or whether they don't see the window or whether everybody hits the window. Um, but we get in a lot of window strike raptors, um, which is really unfortunate. They are big birds. They tend to hit really hard and very often don't survive the impact um, and, uh, and stuff. So it's a, it's a, it is a known phenomenon. Um, Daniel Clem, who studies uh, windows and birds um, and has for 40 years now, wrote in 1981, the first article um, really detailing that habit. Um, but again, it just, it could just be that they were attracted to the large flocks of birds that were there. Um, but they also can fall victim to the same problem of, uh, of glass and, uh, and windows. Um, Daniel Clem is one of the, the incredibly well-known folks who have studied um, windows and birds and the problems. Um, he's a United States ornithologist, and he's been doing a lot of research into the mortality of birds due to glass windows. Um, and he's, uh, he's currently a professor of ornithology and his research has influenced the design of buildings. I know that um, Michael Mazur in Toronto um, founded the FLAT program with the idea of trying to go out and, and save some of these birds. And of course, in the process has done a lot of research around which buildings and what are the factors involved in that kind of thing. And, um, and Daniel Clem has done a lot of the research around um, I think more in terms of uh, what what can we do to protect the birds and what how do we how, how do we help the birds sort of see the glass um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, and so he's been a design consultant for um, the design in, in several buildings um, including the Niagara Falls State Park Observation Tower um, and so he has several U.S. patents relating to window designs um, and he's and he's written about um, Solid Air is a book that's specifically about about some of the new research dedicated to, uh, to birds and windows. So he began some of the tunnel work to test the, the birds' reactions to the different patterns of deterrence on glass. Um, because we used to think, well, if you put a pattern on the glass, the birds would see it um, and maybe avoid it and that kind of thing. And so this is a... Um, this is a tunnel that they use for research. It's at the Powder Mill Nature Reserve. Um, they've been working with different glass companies to try and design a type of patterned glass that birds can see um, so that they don't fly into them. Um, because birds can see up into the UV range, which humans can't see. And so if you can infuse the glass with different types of UV, um, sort of spider webs, um, then the birds would see that and realize that that's a solid object, um, but we don't see it. And so all we see is just pretty glass. Um, so they use this particular um, building to test the design. And so the patterned glass is placed um, at one end of the tunnel next to a plain panel of glass, and it's completely open beyond the glass, and the researcher releases the bird at the other end, and they can see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, and they fly towards it thinking that it's their way out. Um, there's a mist net, so there's a net put up in front of the glass, so they never actually hit the glass and, um, and things, but they can and they can they take pictures and they're testing and they're seeing um, sort of which way is the bird going? Is it going towards the patterned glass or is it going towards the plain glass? Um, and uh, it's a, one of only two bird flight test tunnels. Um, and so it was built in partnership with the American Bird Conservancy. Um, and so it's really interesting um, because they're they're actually finding some some 
some things out. They have to have it on a, on a rocker system because it has to move based on how the sun would actually hit the glass on a real life type of way. So it pivots over the course of the day to mimic the same reflective qualities um, so that they're measuring equal effects. Otherwise, if it's dark at one point in the day and light at another point in the day, um, the mirrors that they use, however, to, to make that happen, remove some of the UV radiation. So it may be undervaluing the effectiveness of some of the glass that has the UV deflectors in it. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like from the inside. So the bird sees this sort of open, you know, end and, uh, and will go straight that way. Again, there's a net in front, so they never actually hit the glass. Um, and then they're just, there's a door that gets opened and they get released it. Um, none of the glass has reached sort of 100% avoidance, but there are some promising options, which is great. Um, even 73% success rate is fantastic. If those, if we're reducing bird strikes by 73%, that is fantastic. Um, there's, you know, roughly 5% of North Americans total avian population dying every year. So uh, any, any, anything would be great to find a solution. Um, this is what some of the glass looks like to the birds. Um, and so it can, it can test a lot of preventive measures at one time. It doesn't kill the birds. The problem is it doesn't accurately reflect what a bird experiences when they're faced with a real window. Um, they're released into a dark tunnel um, and they're stimulated to fly to the bright end, um, making that choice to move to safety. Although apparently chickadees just kind of go and hang on the roof, which is really cute. And house sparrows look around and go, whatever, I'm just gonna hang around and they hop around on the ground. So different species have different personalities personalities. Um, but in real life, birds are out in a bright environment and they fly into darker spaces rather than from the dark space into the light um, because where their habitat is, is kind of inside that tree. So they're moving from the bright area into the tree because they tend to like the, the safety of all of those branches and things. And so they're actually usually moving away from the, the open space and into the darkness. And so the test limitations um, really um, have resulted in Dr. Clem having to develop an experimental design um, using a field test that accurately simulates windows in real buildings, which is basically, um, here's the field and here's the, the trees that they're gonna fly into. And he puts the glass in front of those bushes. And then let's see how many birds actually fly into that glass and don't realize that it's a solid um, object. And so he's field testing it. Um, and I know that there's some controversy because um, when birds hit the windows, they die. But um, the number of birds that hit these windows um, is much less than, um, than are currently hitting windows across North America. And if some good can come from it, um, then uh, that's, that sort of has been his decision. Um, that if we can figure out what glass to use and get people to use it, that would be fantastic. Um, and again, they can see into the UV spectrum, and so they can see these funny little lines and cobwebs in the glass, but we don't. Um, ideally, the glass is not any more expensive than regular glass. The problem at this point is convincing um, a company to make it. Walker Glass is... Um, is in Quebec, and so they're a nice Canadian company, and, uh, and they do make it. Um, making it in large quantities is, is what needs to happen. And so we really have to get Saskatoon on board with developing bird-friendly building guidelines. Um, lots of other cities have them. There is a federal set of guidelines coming out, um, and if we wait long enough, we will simply be forced to adopt those, um, but we could do better than that. And uh, so if the city of Saskatoon is willing and able, um, as I have have continued to try and uh, convince them to develop uh, bird-friendly guidelines, then all the new buildings will have Walker glass or Ornolux glass in it, and we don't have to worry about bird strikes. Um, and of course, my concern is that we're on a bit of a building spree right now, and so all of these buildings are going to last for 40 to you know, 70, 80 years, and, uh, and we're going to be killing that many more birds. 
um, if we don't get these things, um, if we don't get these these rules in place sooner than later. In the meantime, until this isn't, you know, most of us aren't doing new builds. Most of us are having an old house and we have to retrofit. And so how can you save the birds? What can you do? You, unfortunately, you're gonna have to do a whole bunch of creative things. Um, it has to be two by two inches spacing, because if you can think about it, birds know how to fly through branches and they can fly through very small spaces. And so when you have a chickadee, a chickadee is less likely to fly through um, lines that go up and down because they'd have to, you know, twist sideways or something. If these bars went horizontally, then they might actually try and get through those again, unless they were about two inches apart. So the safest thing is two inches by two inches. This is an American Bird Conservancy tape. Um, they have its UV um, infused. And so it lasts anywhere from two years to 10 years. Um, it does wear off over time and has to be replaced. Um, but uh, you can make it look really pretty with this nice crosshatch pattern. They have an invisible version that I think is less, um, less likely to be seen. Strings. Strings are really easy. Um, efficient, inexpensive. Uh, there's actually apparently a company that sells these now um, that you can buy and put up, or you can do sort of the homemade version, um, such as this one on the right, and uh, just make your own um, if you have a, a handy person in your life. Um, so again, uh, this is Brenda down at uh, Beaver Creek Conservation Area, and she was putting strings on the windows there to try and, uh, and reduce some of the bird strikes. Um, they now have gone to using the feather-friendly dots. Um, and this, this one on the left looks like it actually, um, they probably move a little bit in the wind, um, but at least there's enough of them there that uh, the birds will see the window even if the, the wind isn't blowing. Feather friendly dots are probably my favorite and I don't get any kickback for selling them. Um, I really like them. We have them on our windows. I have one window that has a bit of a tunnel effect and, uh, and we had we very much had to put the, the dots on. This is at the Canadian Wildlife Service building on campus. Um, and since they study birds, I thought it was very appropriate that they put them on. I was there for a meeting and, uh, and heard a bird thump on the window and went down to find it. Um, and it had died, unfortunately. Um, and I think within a year or so, they had put these dots on. But you can see how even in this, in the right hand picture, the dots are on, you don't see them. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, so they can be pretty pretty much um, invisible at a distance or from the inside of the building. A lot of times we used to, well, even in my lifetime, we used to sort of suggest that we put up these sort of uh, silhouettes, um, particularly if it was a predatory silhouette. The problem is that, again, birds either don't see them when they're in a panic and they're flying through, or they figure, oh, I can just go around that. And so you would have to cover your window so thoroughly that uh, you wouldn't actually be able to see out. And so these, these see-through options are much better um, for us and certainly for the birds. If you don't own your house and you don't want to make the investment in something that's permanent, you can use um, paint uh, and make pretty designs. You, you know, Easter's come in, you can draw Easter eggs, you can put tape on the window, Almost anything that makes the, the window um, visible to birds would be fantastic. Feeders are another huge issue. We all love to feed our birds and we always want to put the feeder um, close enough that we can see the bird. So it's probably five to 10 feet away from the house, maybe 20 feet away. And we used to say, well, three feet close or 30 feet away. But the reality is really the only safe feeder is right next to the window. Um, or on the window. So as close as possible to the window. Those 30 feet away um, feeders, unfortunately, when those birds are flushed by a predator, they are not paying attention and they are flying at that point pretty much full speed when they hit your window. And so, um, so putting your feeder as close to your window as possible is the safest thing for the birds. Um, then they will not be able to, to hit the window with any force. So that's a, some newer research that's coming out. Um, you can do whatever you like. You can make pretty patterns. You can use 
colored dots. You can put up screens, anything that makes your window visible to those birds. Um, and, uh, and it makes a huge difference. And you will have saved probably a hundred birds because there are at least that many that are hitting probably almost every house in Saskatoon, unfortunately. Um, let's see if I can, I don't know if this is going to play. This is a, oh, there we go. So this was the airport in the fall of 2020. They had an absolutely horrible um, bird strike day um, or week. And uh, so this is, this poor woman was going to work and she was finding, she just she took a video as she walked along the front of the Saskatoon airport. And, uh, and I went up and picked up uh, 86 birds in less than an hour. And uh, I, would, I would pick one up and I would turn around and it would crash behind me. And so I couldn't get from one end to the airport to the other uh, without more birds just hitting constantly. Um, and it was quite horrifying, I was crying. And, and that continued um, at the airport. Unfortunately, um, for a couple of days, they did finally manage to get these streamers up, which worked absolutely wonderfully. Um, and I saw that in subsequent years that they've put them up again. Um, last year, and hopefully they'll put them up this spring. Um, and I've talked to the airport management and they're looking at um, a more permanent solution going forward, hopefully as travel picks up and their revenues pick up a bit, um, they'll be able to fix those windows in a more permanent manner. But uh, it was it was a really, really bad um, fallout, uh, unfortunately. But as you can see, anything that really makes those windows stand out as a, as a solid object, um, we'll fix, we'll semi fix the problem. We went from 100 birds a day to two. So that was huge. So what can we do to support our birds? There's so many things. You can treat your own windows. Um, ideally do that and convince family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, strangers, everybody that you can possibly talk to to treat their windows. Um, write to your MLA asking them to support bird-friendly building guidelines for Saskatoon. Um, the sooner we get that, the sooner that we have safe buildings going up. Um, talk to your friends if they happen to be architects or developers or businesses about the benefits of building bird-friendly. Become a flight crew member with LSWR. Um, recruit your friends to join. Um, a flight crew member is somebody who uh, is basically is on the lookout for these birds that are that are window strikes that have been that have hit the windows. If you work in downtown, if you work in a building with glass, um, are you willing to be somebody that would that would do a quick check coming and going, or where you know maybe a building next door to you has a bird strike and they don't know what to do, but they can bring it to you. We make sure that you have bags and boxes and um, and everything that you need to house those little animals and then call us and we will come and grab them. Um, putting, um, giving those animals, those birds, a little bit of pain medication and some anti-inflammatories, which reduces some of the inflammation in their brain when they hit, um, has been demonstrated to be very helpful. Uh, we always say put them in a box with something on the bottom of the box so that they're not sliding around um, and just keep them in a really quiet, dark place you can imagine having a migraine. You don't want dogs, cats, kids. You want a quiet, dark place. And I will always say, don't open the box. Um, the, the biggest thing is everybody wants to kind of open the box and peek at the bird. Don't do that. Because if it has woken up, and it will fly out. And, uh, and that's bad because it might be able to fly far enough to get away from you. But if it's broken or if it has a brain hemorrhage, um, it, uh, it's, it's not going to necessarily make it. So uh, save a life. Know what to do if you find an injured bird. Um, you can build a catio to keep your cats in. You can put tagging on fences to make them more visible. Slow down on the roads in the spring. Clean your feeders um, and your bird baths. That's a really big thing. We actually have an avian influenza possibly coming towards us in Saskatoon. So um, cleaning up when on those places where we tend <coughs> to bring our birds. Um, really important. Um, leaving up dead trees for shelter and food um, is also helpful. Um, if you want more birds in your yard, plant native plants. Something that I learned is that native plants actually have 80% more insects than our decorative plants, and the birds will follow the insects. Um, so support the Saskatoon Nature Society in their bid to have the Saskatoon become a certified by Nature Canada as a bird-friendly city. Uh, it's an endless list. I could keep going. 
um, lots of different ways to support our birds. Uh, report all of the window strike birds, dead or alive. So if you happen to find a bird, um, you can either report it on the bird mapper, which has a, a wonderful um, app that will do that, or you can go to our website, birdsandwindows.ca, and we have a bird collision reporting form. And you can send that to us, and then we will input that into the database. If you go to the bird mapper um, online, you will be able to zoom in on Saskatoon and you can see where all of the birds have been found because we put all of our window strike birds onto that um, onto that site. And so it's very interesting to see where those birds are coming from. Um, I'm sure that it's biased because it is just the birds that have been found and notified to us or brought to us. And we do take, um, well, we do take window strike birds dead or alive um, because uh, we, we need to know how many are living and how many are dying. Um, all we get usually get are the, the injured ones. And so we always sort of say, well, I'd like to know. And in fact, we'd also like to know if a bird hits the window and between the moment it goes thump and the moment that you walk outside to go pick it up, it manages to fly away and it's okay, hopefully. Um, we wanna know that too. That's a window strike and that needs to be reported as a, as a bird that's happened to survive. Dates of importance, um, the Saskatoon Nature Society, Living Sky Wildlife Rehab and SOS Trees, we're all planning activities to celebrate International Migratory Bird Day, which is on May 14th. Um, that's gonna be a big day for us. And the 21st to the 29th is Arbor Week. And I put that in here because birds and trees kind of go together. You need birds to have trees, you need trees to have birds. Um, so it's a, it's a really good week to, uh, to sort of celebrate uh, and join them in celebrating birds and trees. Some of the different resources. Um, we have birdsandwindows.ca. It is part of the Living Sky Wildlife Rehabilitation website. It has um, everything, hopefully, that you would want to know. It has kind of what to do if you found a bird, um, how to fix the problem, um, which we've talked about tonight, um, and all sorts of other resources, and hopefully a way to um, join the flight crew, as well as a way to report bird strikes and that sort of thing. So it has um, all the information that, that you could possibly want. Um, otherwise, you can always refer to some of these other sites as well. And any questions? This is a picture of all of the bird strikes that, uh, that did not survive. Um, we keep them. And uh, the, the Fatal Light Attraction Program in Toronto does one. Theirs fills sort of like the floor of an entire building. Um, but uh, this is ours and it was several hundred birds. Um, and one of my volunteers did a really lovely job of being quite artistic in arranging them. And, uh, and stuff. So it looks pretty, but um, it's, it's not actually pretty when you think about how they died. All right. Any questions? I hope I didn't go over time.